Hello. So today we are going to discuss about tumors of the ovary. Now, with more than 20,000 new cases diagnosed annually, ovarian cancer is the eighth most common cancer in the U.S. women. It also is the fifth leading contributor to cancer mortality in women with an estimated 14,000 deaths in 2010. Now, tumors of the ovary are amazingly varied unlike other tumors and the diversity in this tumor is attributed to the presence of the three cell types in the normal ovary like one of the cell types is the multipotent surface silomic epithelium then the other is the totipotent germ cells and the sac called stromal cells each of which give rise to the number of different tumors which we will discuss shortly now the totipotent germ cells are basically cells which can be converted into any of the cell lineages and in contrast multipotent can also be converted into any other cell type but the spectrum is a bit lower than the totipotent germ cells. Now neoplasms of the surface epithelial origin account for the great majority of the primary ovarian tumor and in their malignant forms account for almost like 90% of the ovarian cancers. Germ cell and sex caught stromal tumors are much less frequent, although they constitute 20% to 30% of the ovarian tumors. And they are collectively responsible for less than like 10% of the malignant tumors of the ovary. Now we can see the structure of the ovary so that here is like the surface epithelium is present then there is a cortex of the ovary and then there is a medulla of the ovary and then there is a stroma of the ovary as well so the surface epithelial tumors have different subtypes and one of the subtypes is the serous tumor the other is the mucinous tumor the third one is the endometrioid tumor the fourth is clear cell tumor fifth is Brenner tumor and sixth is cyst adenofibroma. The germ cell tumor subtypes are teratoma, dysgerminoma, endodermal sinus tumor and choriocarcinoma. And the sex cord stromal tumors include fibroma, granulosa theta cell tumor and sartorly ledic cell tumor. So we will discuss surface epithelial tumor first. Now the vast majority of the ovarian neoplasm is derived from the silomic epithelium that covers the surface of the ovary. So almost the majority of the ovarian tumors are surface epithelial tumors. Now what happens that during repeated ovulation and scarring, surface epithelium becomes entrapped in the cortex of the ovary and hence it can form small epithelial cysts. Now when these cysts are formed, they can become metaplastic like changing into the different cell lineage or undergo neoplastic transformation to give rise to a number of different epithelial tumors. Now benign lesions usually are cystic and may have an accompanying stromal component. Now when it's only cystic, when it's only cystic, it's known as cyst adenoma. And when it's also accompanying a stromal component, we will call it cyst adenofibroma. So it can also become malignant. Malignant tumors may also be cystic, and they are called cyst adenocarcinoma, or they will be completely solid and will be frank carcinoma. So, surface epithelial tumors, what we have said, can be both benign and malignant. When they are benign, they can be cystic, and hence they can be called cyst adenoma. And when they will have an accompanying stromal component, so we will say that it's cyst adenofibroma. Similarly, surface epithelial tumors can be malignant, and when they are malignant, malignant as well as cystic, we will say that it's cyst adenocarcinoma. But when it's completely solid, and malignant we will say it's frank carcinoma 
Now, some ovarian epithelial tumors fall into an intermediate borderline category and currently it is referred to as tumors of low malignant potential. These are best considered low-grade cancers with limited invasion potential and understandably carry a better prognosis than that for overtly malignant ovarian carcinomas. So the important risk factors for ovarian cancers include nulliparity, family history, and germ line mutation in certain tumor suppressor genes. There is a high incidence of carcinoma in unmarried women and married women with low parity. And of interest that prolonged use of oral contraceptive uh, pills somewhat reduces the risk. The point is that the greater the ovulation, uh, so the greater will be the chance of developing these surface epithelial tumors. And um, the lesser the ovulation, so lesser the chance of uh, surface epithelial tumor. So the more ovulation will be there, so th there will be a chance of more scarring and more like uh, building the neoplastic potential. But when, for example, it's not ovulating a lot and women is having a lot of children, so what will happen that their ovulatory cycles will be suppressed. Similarly, like oral, oral contraceptive pills are also inhibiting the ovulation and hence can somewhat decrease the risk of the ovarian tumor, especially this surface epithelial tumor. Now around 5% to 10% of the ovarian cancers are familial, genetic, and most of these are associated with mutations in BRCA1 and BRCA2 tumor suppressor genes. Now mutations in BRCA1 and BRCA genes we will discuss in the later podcast that is also associated with hereditary breast cancer. And the average lifetime risk for ovarian cancer approximate like 30% in BRCA1 carriers and the risk in BRCA2 carriers somewhat lower than the BRCA1 carriers. And in contrast with familial ovarian cancers, mutations in BRCA1 and BRCA2 um, genes are found in only 8 to 10% of sporadic ovarian cancers, which appear to arise through an alternative molecular mechanism. Serious tumors are the most common of the ovarian uh, epithelial tumors and about 60% are benign and 15% are of like slightly lower malignant potential and 25% are malignant. So benign lesions are usually encountered in patients between 30 and 40 years of age and malignant serious tumors are more commonly seen between 45 and 65 years of age. So hence the malignancy uh, of the serous tumors is most common post -menopause, in postmenopausal age. So when taken together, uh, borderline and malignant uh, serous tumors are the most common ovarian malignancies accounting for about like 60% of all ovarian cancers. So the emerging evidence indicates that there are two types of serous carcinoma. One is low grade, one other is high grade. So the former arises from benign or borderline lesions and progress slowly in a stepwise manner to become invasive carcinoma. And these low-grade tumors are associated with KERAS, BRAF, or ERBB2 mutations. The high-grade serous tumors develop rapidly as compared to the low grade which develops slowly and slowly and gradually and it become invasive but the high grade serous tumors develop rapidly. Now it's already mentioned that at least some of these high grade lesions develop from tubal intraepithelial carcinoma rather than the true ovarian silomic epithelium. Recently the deep sequencing of high grade uh, serious carcinoma has confirmed that 96% of tumors have mutations in P53 and mutations affecting the north signaling pathway and Fox M1 air transcription factors previously indicated in the pathogenesis of ovarian carcinoma were also detected in a sizable minority of the tumors. If we can talk about the prognosis um, with invasion, uh, invasive cirrhosis, 
adenocarcinoma so it's usually poor even after the surgery or radiation therapy or chemotherapy and it highly uh, depends uh, on the disease stage at the diagnosis so if tumor appears confined only to the ovary frank carcinoma have a five-year survival rate of about 70 percent whereas tumors of low malignant, malignant potential are associated with nearly 100 percent survival rate now with cancer that has penetrated the capsule the 10-year survival rate is usually very less and that's less than 15 percent so let us talk about the morphology of the serous tumors the most uh, serous tumors are large spherical geoid cystic structures up to 30 to 40 centimeter in diameter so 25 percent of these benign tumors are bilateral that is on the both sides of the ovary in the benign tumor the serosal covering is smooth and glistening that is shiny by contrast the surface of the cyst adenocarcinoma has nodular irregularities due to denting areas in which tumor has penetrated into the serosa. Now, in cut sections, small cystic tumors may have a single cavity, but larger ones frequently are divided by multiple septa into multiloculated masses. Now, the cystic spaces usually are filled with clear serous fluid, and protruding into the cystic cavities are the papillary projections which are more prominent in the malignant tumor. So on histological exam, what happens is that the benign tumors contain a single layer of a tall columnar epithelial cell, which will line the cyst or cyst, and usually that columnar epithelium is also ciliated. And somoma bodies are commonly found in the tips of the papillae. So let us recall the somoma bodies, that somoma bodies are basically concentrically laminated calcified concretions so some of my bodies are also associated with the serous uh, ovarian carcinomas so when frank carcinoma develops like true carcinoma invasion develops what happens that anaplasia of lining cell will appear as does invasion of stroma so in carcinoma papillary formations are complex and multi-layered and nests or undifferentiated sheets of malignant cells invade the axial fibrous tissue. Between clearly benign and obviously malignant forms lie tumors of low malignant potential. And when we will say that it's a tumor of low malignant potential, it means that the tumor is exhibiting less cytological atypia, like lesser deviation from the normal epithelium and typically little or no stromal invasion so tumors of low malignant potential may see the peritoneum but it's fortunate somehow that these tumor implants implants are usually non-invasive so in general the malignant serous tumors want to spread through the regional lymph nodes including periodic lymph nodes and distant lymphatic and hematogenous metastases are infrequent so they are usually spreading through the local uh, regional lymph nodes. Now let us talk about mucinous tumors and in most respects uh, uh, they are similar to the serous tumors. But the essential difference between the serous tumors and mucinous tumors is that neoplastic epithelium will secrete the mucin secreting cell which are present. So these tumors occur in women in the same age range as those for serous tumors but are considerably less likely to be malignant. So serious tumors are most likely to be malignant, but the mucinous tumors are less likely to be malignant. And overall, only 10% of the mucinous tumors are malignant, and another 10% are of low malignant potential, and 80% are like benign. So 80% is a big number, which are benign. So the prognosis of the mucinous cyst adenocarcinoma is somewhat better with its serous counterpart. So like mucinous cyst adenocarcinoma is a malignant tumor, but its prognosis is very much better than the serous cyst adenocarcinoma. And although the stage rather than the histological type is the major determinant of the outcome. 
So in morphology, like on cross-examination, the mucinous tumors produce cystic masses that may be indistinguishable from the serous tumor, except by the mucinous nature of the cystic components. However, they are more likely to be larger and multi-cystic. Cirrhosis penetration and solid areas of growth are usually suggestive of malignancy. And on histological examination, the cysts are lined by mucinous, uh, mucine producing epithelial cells as expected, and malignant tumors are characterized by the presence of architectural complexity, including solid areas of growth, cellular st stratification, cytological atypia, and stromal invasion, the most important factors of uh, confirming the malignancy of any tumors. Compared with the serous tumors, mucinous tumors are much less likely to be bilateral. And this feature is somewhat uh, useful in differentiating mucinous tumors of the ovary from metastatic mucinous adenocarcinoma from a gastrointestinal tract primary, which more often produces bilateral ovarian masses. And it's known as Krukenberg tumor. So, but the point is that when it's a um, mucinous adenocarcinoma and it is metastasized from gastrointestinal tract, so it will be bilateral and we will say it's a Krukenberg tumor. So what I mean is that the serous tumors are usually bilateral and mucinous tumors are much less likely to be bilateral. So if the mucinous tumors seem to be bilateral, so we have to uh, rule out in our differential any sort of metastasis from gastrointestinal tract. And the tumor which is arising from the gastrointestinal tract, it's mucinous in nature and bilateral, that tumor of the ovary is called Krukenberg tumor. Now, ruptured ovarian mucinous tumors may seed the peritoneum. However, these deposits typically are transient and fail to establish long-term growth in the peritoneum. So implantation of the mucinous tumors in the peritoneum with production of copious amount of new mucin is called pseudomyxoma peritonei. And in most cases, this disorder is caused by the metastasis from the gastrointestinal tract, primarily from the appendix. Now, endometrioid tumors. Now, these tumors may be solid or cystic, and they sometimes develop in association with the endometriosis. Now, on microscopic examination, they are distinguished by the formation of the tubule and the tubular glands, similar to those we have found in the endometrium, within the lining of the cystic spaces. Although benign and borderline forms exist, endometrioid tumors usually are malignant. They are bilateral in about 30% of the cases, and 15 to 30% of women with these ovarian tumors have concomitant endometrial carcinoma. So similar to endometrioid type carcinoma of the endometrium, endometrioid carcinoma of the ovary has mutations in the P10 tumor suppressor genes. A quick word about the Brenner tumor. The Brenner tumor is an uncommon solid, usually unilateral ovarian tumor consisting of abundant stroma containing nests of transitional type of epithelium usually resembling urinary, urinary tract. So it's sort of uroepithelium, classical transitional type epithelium. So occasionally the nests are cystic and are lined by the columnar mucus secreting cells. So Brenner tumors generally are smoothly encapsulated and gray-white on cut section, ranging from a few centimeter to 20 centimeter in diameter. Now, these tumors may arise from the surface epithelium or from urogenital epithelium trapped within the germinal ridge. Although most are benign, both malignant and borderline tumors have been described in the literature. Now, we will discuss the germ cell tumors. Now, it's the second most common type of ovarian tumor, almost 15% of the cases, and usually occur in the women of reproductive age. So tumor subtypes mimic tissues normally produced by the germ cells. So it can arise from the fetal tissue, 
and we'll, we will call it cystic teratoma and embryonal carcinoma. If it's arising from all sites, you will say it's a dysgerminoma. If it's arising from the yolk sac, you will say it's endodermal sinus tumor. And if it's arising from the placental tissue, we will say it's a choriocarcinoma. So now let us first of all discuss the teratomas. So teratomas constitute 15% to 20% of ovarian tumors. So a distressing feature of these germ cell tumors is their predilection to arise in the first two decades of life. To make matters worse, the younger the person, the greater the likelihood of the malignancy. So more than 90% of these germ cells um, neoplasms, however, are benign mature cystic teratoma and the immature malignant variant is rare. So let's try to discuss first of all first of all benign mature cystic teratomas. Now almost all benign mature cystic teratomas are marked by the presence of mature tissues derived from all three germ cells there, like ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. Usually these tumors contain uh, cysts lined by the epidermis replete with adenexal appendages and hence the common designation of this sort of tumor is the dermoid cysts. Most are discovered in young women as ovarian masses or are found incidentally on abdominal radiographs of skin because they contain foci of calcification produced by tooth-like structures contained within the tumor. About 90% of these uh, are unilateral with the right side more commonly affected and rarely do these uh, cystic masses exceed greater than 10 centimeters in diameter. Now on cut section they often are filled with sebaceous secretions and matted hair that when removed reveal a hair bearing epidermal lining and sometimes in these uh, yeah, mature cystic teratomas, there is a nodular projection from which teeth may protrude as well. So occasionally foci of bone and cartilage and some nests of bronchial or gastrointestinal epithelium and other tissues also are present. Now for some uh, unknown uh, reasons, these neoplasms sometimes produce infertility and are prone to undergo ovarian torsion in about like 10 to 15 percent of the cases and will present uh, clinically as acute surgical emergency. So a rare but uh, fascinating link of these teratomas is with a paraneoplastic uh, uh, complication known as limbic encephalitis and which may develop in women with teratomas containing mature neural tissues. And after remits, the moment the tumor is resected. So in about 1% of cases, malignant transformation, usually to squamous cell carcinoma, is also seen. So now we will discuss about the immature malignant teratomas, which are showing the uh, characteristics of malignancies. So malignant immature teratomas are found early in life. The mean age at clinical detection is usually like around 18 years. They differ strikingly from benign mature teratomas insofar as they often are bulky, much more bulky than other uh, benign cystic teratoma. It's predominantly solid when you cut section it and it's punctuated by some of the areas of the necrosis and uncommonly cystic foci may be present and it may contain sebaceous secretions here and other features similar to those of mature teratoma. So on microscopic examination the distinguishing feature is the presence of immature elements or minimally differentiated cartilage, bone, muscle, nerve and other tissues. So the particularly the villain or the ominous agent in this immature malignant teratoma, so the villain of the movie is foresight of neuroepithelial differentiation.
And in view of the propensity of such foci to be aggressive and metastasize widely, so immature teratomas are fourth graded and staged in an effort to predict their behavior. So grade one stage one tumors often can be cured with appropriate therapy, whereas those of higher grade and stage are associated with much more guarded outlook as common in other malignancies as well. So there is a third category, specialized teratomas, and it's a rare subtype of teratoma and it's composed entirely of specialized tissue. And the most common example is the stroma ovari, which is composed entirely of the mature thyroid tissue that may actually produce hyperthyroidism. And these tumors usually appear as small, solid, unilateral, brown ovarian masses. And other specialized teratomas may take the form of ovarian carcinoids and which in rare instances can produce carcinoid uh, syndrome. Clinically correlations and with all the ovarian neoplasms, uh, management poses a formidable clinical challenge because symptoms or signs usually appear when the tumors are way advanced. The clinical presentation is remarkably similar except with functioning neoplasms that exerts hormonal effects. So ovarian tumors of surface epithelial origin usually are asymptomatic until they become large enough to call the local pressure symptoms. For example, it can present as pain, gastrointestinal complaints or urinary frequencies and they are just pinching the ureter or any sort of gastrointestinal organ. So indeed about 30% of all ovarian neoplasms are discovered incidentally on routine gynecological examination. And larger masses, particularly the common epithelial tumor, may cause an increase in abdominal girth. And smaller masses, particularly like teratomas, dermoid cysts, sometimes twists on their pedicle and can produce that classical torsion and presents as acute abdomen. So metastatic steering of the malignant serous tumors often causes ascites, a very, very prominent feature of uh, ovarian tumors, whereas functioning ovarian tumors often comes to tension when it's using any sort, sort of endocrine disturbance known as endocrinopathies. So it's not fortunate, like it's unfortunate that treatment of ovarian tumors remains unsatisfactory. Only a modest decrease in survival has been achieved since the mid-1970s. Screening methods that detect early tumors are uh, needed, but those evaluated to date are of limited value. Of such markers, the protein C125 is elevated in the sera of 75% to 90% of women with epithelial ovarian tumor. However, however, C125 is undetectable in up to 50% of women with cancer limit to the, limited to the ovary. Conversely, it is often elevated in a variety of the benign conditions and non-ovarian cancers. Hence, its usefulness as a screening tool in asymptomatic postmenopausal women is limited. So currently, CA125 measurements are of pretest value in monitoring response to the, to the therapy rather than screening of the ovarian tumors. Now we will discuss about uh, germ cell tumors. So it's the uh, second most common type of ovarian tumor. Almost 15% of the cases usually occurs of germ cell uh, tumors. Usually occur in women of reproductive age. So less than 45 years of age is usually reproductive age. So that's why in that age it's most common. It's a tumor that mimic uh, tissues normally produced by germ cells. So, what are the um, what are the cells which are normally produced by the uh, germ cells? So, first is fetal tissue. So, when tumor arises from the fetal tissue, we call it cystic teratoma and embryonal carcinoma. And we have discussed cystic teratoma previously. Then, it, if it is arising from oocytes, so we will call it dysgerminoma. And if it arises from yolk sac, we will say it's endodermal sinus uh, tumor. And if it's arising from placental tissue, we will say it's a choriocarcinoma. Now, 
This germinoma is a tumor composed of large cells with clear cytoplasm and central nuclei and it usually resembles the oocytes in the ovary and it's the most common malignant germ cell tumor. And the testicular counterpart, which we will discuss in the next podcast, is known as seminoma. So which is relatively a common uh, germ cell tumor in males. So this germinoma usually has a good prognosis and it responds uh, to radiotherapy and serum LDH might be the only serum marker which we will find to be elevated in the dysgerminoma. Now coming towards endodermal sinus tumor. So it's a malignant tumor that mimics the yolk sac and it's the most common germ cell tumor in children. So in children what is most common that is endodermal sinus tumor. So Serum AFP is also elevated in this endodermal sinus tumor and the characteristic glomerulus-like structures which are present in the endodermal sinus tumors and they are found on histology are known as shillard wall bodies. So shillard wall bodies are characteristic features of endodermal sinus tumor. Then choriocarcinoma. Choriocarcinoma is a malignant tumor composed of trophoblast and syncytial trophoblast and it mimics the placental tissue but the difference between choriocarcinoma and the real normal placental tissue is that villi are absent in the choriocarcinoma. So it's a small hemorrhagic tumor with early hematogenous spread. PDHCG might be high and it's characteristic just because syncytial trophoblast as we all know produces high amount of PDHCG. So, PDHCG is elevated in the choriocarcinoma and it may lead towards the thecal cyst in the ovary. And it usually has a poor response to the chemotherapy. Then a word about embryonal carcinoma, it's a malignant tumor composed of large primitive cells and it's usually aggressive with early metastasis. And lastly we are discussing about the sex cord stromal tumors and they are tumors that resemble sex cord stromal tumors tissue of the ovary which includes granulosa theca cell tumor, sartoli, ladex cell tumor and fibroma. So granulosa theca cell tumor is basically the neoplastic proliferation of granulosa and theca cells and due to its proliferation produces excess of estrogen with signs and symptoms of excess estrogen. So if prior to puberty there is excess estrogen so what we will lead towards is precocious puberty. In reproductive age, if there is excess estrogen, what will be the signs? We will have menorrhagia or metorrhagia. If in the postmenopausal phase there is excess estrogen, so usually there is endometrial hyperplasia with postmenopausal uterine bleeding. So it's most common setting for granulosa theca cell tumors in postmenopausal age, in which there is endometrial hyperplasia with postmenopausal uterine bleeding. So granulosa theca cell tumor is malignant but the metastasis risk is slightly low as compared to other tumors. Then Sartoli Ladex cell tumor. It's composed of Sartoli cells that forms tubules and Ladex cells which are in between the tubules. And the characteristic crystals which are found in Sartoli Ladex cell tumor is called Ranky crystals and it produces excess of androgens and excess of androgen is associated with hirsutism and viralization in females. And then last fibroma comes into the category of the sex cord stromal tumors. It's a benign tumor of fibroblast and it's associated with pleural effusion and ascites. So fibroma, pleural effusion and ascites is known as Meek syndrome and it usually resolves once the tumor is removed. This concludes our ovarian tumor podcast.